Good evening, friends. This is our final session of the Christian Believer Study, and we are looking at uh, chapter 29 on eternal life. Now, chapter 30 is in the book. It is filled with a lot of words, and you can read them if you really want to. And if you don't really want to, you're not missing much. Obviously, the readings of the companion book are always nice to kind of see the, the theologians in their own terms, but this is our final session. So this is the, the kind of last bit. So we've talked about all of salvation. We've talked about the world to come generally, but the phrase that we're going to focus on tonight is eternal. The fact that the world to come and the new life we have is eternal life. So before we get going, I want us to look back and review. So remember our definition of salvation from this class. Salvation is not merely being forgiven. Salvation is participation in the divine nature. This begins at our baptism when we are united to Jesus and we begin to be transformed. Now, we remember that death is a consequence, not necessarily a punishment from God, but is a consequence of sin, right? We cut ourselves off from God and so we die. Without Jesus, our natural destination is the land of the dead. But with Jesus, Jesus allows us to follow him to where we are, to where he is. So we are with Jesus in life, so we will be with Jesus in death. So we do not go to the land of the dead, we go to heaven. Everybody's remembering this. But heaven is not eternal life. Heaven is where we wait for the final judgment the resurrection of our bodies, and the life in the world to come. Now, in the world to come, both heaven and earth are dissolved and remade, purified of evil. And yes, heaven is also dissolved because the scriptures talk about spiritual evils in the heavenly places. And when we're talking about heaven, remember, heaven's not a place. It's just talking about the spiritual reality. So the heavens and the earth talks about the spiritual and physical creation. So just as there is earthly evil, there is spiritual evil. So the heavens are also dissolved. Now, in the new creation, God comes down to live on the new earth with us mortals. This is a marriage of earth and heaven, of the physical and of the spiritual. Everything is still physical, it's still matter in creation, but it's saturated with God's spirit. Uh, remember we talked about our resurrected bodies last week, that our resurrected bodies are not just matter like we are now, continued, but not dying. It is what we are clothed with divine glory. So we have what we are now plus divine privileges. So when we talk about spiritual things, what we're talking about in the world to come is matter plus. So spiritual existence is more than physical, not less than physical. And of course, on the new earth is where we live with God in perfect happiness forever and ever and ever. And we call this life eternal. Now, the doctrine of eternal life has some obvious bits, but then there's a theological side of it that we need to get into tonight. So the doctrine of eternal life says that in Christ, we will not die again. So once we are resurrected, we do not die again. So the obvious of the doctrine of eternal life is that this changes the way we do our ethical calculus in this life. Right, it changes our priorities. So if life is not over at death, then that means that we don't see death as you know, the final thing. So we are no longer under the compulsion to do as much 
as we can and get as much pleasure or as much comfort or as much power crammed into this life before we die, because that's all we get, right? If death is not seen as any real end, but just a transition, that means that we should be focusing in this life on maximizing our growth into the likeness of God, right? If death is seen as the exam, not the ending, then we should be looking at this life as one giant study session, not the kind of be-all, end-all. The part that we need to get into tonight with the doctrine of eternal life is that eternal life is not a separate doctrine from the doctrine of theosis. And we remember what theosis is. That is us participating in the divine nature by grace, taking on divine characteristics. Theosis is that image of we're like an iron rod being thrust into the divine nature, the fires of God. And just like an iron rod put in a fire will glow and start to take on the um, qualities of the flame, right? It'll get hot. It can start fires elsewhere. We take on the qualities of God. Eternal life is one of those qualities that we take on. So it's not that Jesus, you know, checks off our card and gives us a you're never going to die pass. It's that we are united to divinity, and one of the divine qualities, one of the things that makes God God, is the fact that God is life. So we are participating in God's own life, which is why it's eternal. Now, this happens through Christ, that Christ became human, took up a human nature, and united it with divinity. This means that there is a sense in which eternal life is not predicated on belief or baptism or anything, right? Everybody gets resurrected from the dead. Everybody lives forever in some state. So just the brute fact of not dying again, that's something objective that Jesus does outside of us. He takes human nature and unites it with divinity. And the kind of base level of that means that every human being will be resurrected and will not die again. Now, whether we are living pleasantly or living unpleasantly depends on our response to God's grace. Right, that's part of salvation. Now, when we are looking at what baptism actually does, this is what is allowing us to be participating in that divine life now, to being transformed in our character. So it's not just something Jesus is doing to our nature. There's a real change that is able to happen in this life to our hearts. So baptism starts the divinization, the theosis process now, but everyone is participating in the divine nature to some extent. So it's not, this is what's not the case, it is not the case that Jesus lets us live forever and we are transformed into what Christ is through theosis. Rather, it's we live forever because we are being transformed by grace into what Christ is, right? Because Christ is divinity, life itself, and that's extended to us through our humanity's union with his. So again, eternal life is not just a reward for salvation, it is a necessary consequence, a logical consequence of participation in the divine nature. Now, the second thing that needs to be said about eternal life is the word eternal does not just denote unendingness. So never ending life is encompassed by eternal life, but that's not the only thing it means. 
eternal life is also a descriptor of the quality of our life with God. So the other way is you can separate out eternal life by saying the life is eternal in that it's never ending and that the life is eternal in that it has its source in eternity. So you could also rephrase eternal life as divine life, right? Divine being of God. So it's a different sort of living. We got a little bit of this last week, right? When we talked about the resurrected body, how that's more than just living our current flesh, but not dying, not getting sick. It's a whole different way of living, right? We are touchable, we can eat, and yet we don't have the same relationship to physics, right? Eternal life, just like a resurrected body, is a different modality of living life. And so when we're thinking about how eternal life is life from God, well, that should pique our minds to think, well, we live our life from God now, right? That's what it means to be a Christian, is we're leaning on to God's grace now, and that's exactly right. When we talk about eternal life, this is not just that we will be raised and live forever. It's that even now, as we are baptized, we gain the ability to tap into the divine life. This is part of the subjective transformation that we have, right? We are transformed, we are sanctified, because we are plugging into God's eternal life now. Put another way, eternal life begins at baptism, not death. Say that again. Eternal life begins at baptism, not death. The church fathers saw um, life as a race in which a runner runs run one length of a course, has a pause, they turn around, and then they run the other way all the way into world without end eternity. Most people look at that first course and say, well, that pause at the end, that's death. And then you pause and you turn around and you enter eternity. And the church fathers said, no. That pause is baptism. Where you are living a certain way up until you are baptized, that you die to the world, you are raised with Christ, and then you begin this single shot into eternity. Such that death is not considered a pause at all. De mortal death is just a blip. Close your eyes here, wake up with Jesus. One line of relationship and mode of living continued unbroken. So this means that mortal death is barely important. We start living eternally down here with that life of sanctification because that eternal life is us growing into the image of God, that begins here. So our mode of living changes now and continues out. So while we are in that living in eternity, living in the kingdom of God, we begin in the kingdom of grace. That's us down here, living in the grace of God. So this is why Jesus says, even now, the kingdom of heaven is among you or within you, because it's not just something that we enter the kingdom later, we are in the kingdom as we respond to God's grace in this world. We get to experience it now. It is a present promise that we can experience holiness and happiness by leaning into our baptism and tapping into the divine life extended to us here. Now, that's not to say that when we die, nothing happens. When we die, we enter into the kingdom of glory. This is not something new. It's not a new relationship with God. 
It's the same relationship now with the kind of sinful lens of our bodies not getting in the way anymore. So we get to see it better, see it more clearly. And we get glorified, right? Down here, we're tapping into divine life through grace. In heaven, we actually jump into the full glory of God. We put on glorified garments. So when we say in a funeral, right, that so-and-so has gone on to glory, that's what we mean. That down here, they only participated in God's grace. In heaven, they participate in God's glory. So this also means that when someone dies and we say that so-and-so is in eternity now or has gone on to eternal life, that's not quite right. Because if they've been baptized and living a life of sanctification, that eternal life isn't anything new for them. That is continuing without pause what they have been doing down here. Now they can just see God better. So... Death and entrance into the kingdom of glory should feel like a continuation of what is known and comfortable. The, the way that I can kind of think about this is, imagine you're like out in a rainstorm, and for some reason it's, you know, a summer rainstorm, so you need your sunglasses on, and you run into a room and it's really dark in there. You're safe. You are safe from the storm, and there's somebody else in there, and you get to know them. You can't see them real well, but you get to know them. You're comfortable, you're safe, you have this relationship. Then you die. Your glasses come off. You're in the same room, but now you can see them. Now you can have just an elevated interaction, but that sense of safety, that out of the storm, that same relationship, nothing's changed. You just have a veiled lens removed. So when we die, it's one continuation of a life that began at our baptism. No breaks. I use that metaphor of seeing God because in theology, theologians talk about something called the beatific vision. The beatific vision is the technical term for seeing God face to face without barrier or obstruction. And the idea is when we see God face to face and we are surrounded by God's glory, that is the fulfillment of all of our desire. So we are taking in pure goodness, pure truth, pure beauty, and we are fully content because everything that we could ever desire is fulfilled by the infinite infinity of God. Because anything down here that we desire is actually a desire for God. We just fill that with increasingly um, divine lesser goods. Right? There's a hierarchy of things that we desire. We all we fall into the trap of filling up ourselves up with the lower things, just a lot of them, rather than the one ultimate thing that can actually satiate the longing of our soul. Right? As St. Augustine prays to God, my heart is restless until it rests in you. That beatific vision is the ultimate satiation of any desire because we are overwhelmed by God's energies. Right? Everything finds its culmination. Now, the beatific vision is the end of Christian life, but it's not static. Remember all the times that we've talked about theosis before. We are always becoming like God. And so the more we are like God, the more we can understand of God, the more we can see God, the clearer we can see God. And then the clearer we can see God, the more of God there is to know and become. So we see more, we become more, we can see more, and so we become better, and so we can then see further and then become more, and this is what's happening all the way into eternity. So the beatific vision, this being finally in the presence of God is never boring because there's always something new. 
We're never tired because we are filled with the divine energies. And it's never finished. There is always more of God to discover because we are finite and God is infinite. So the beatific vision is not like us standing in a trance before this beautiful picture, right? It's us delving deeper eternally into the heart of God. And that's our final destiny. That's what we are spending eternal life doing. Lastly, you hear the phrase world without end. So like I said, there's two dimensions to eternal life. One is the eternity of never-endingness. One is the eternity of it's just God's eternity. It's a quality of our life. It's a divine life. But I want to focus on the first one now, the never-endingness, because a lot of people get um, uncomfortable with that because you know the one definition of history is just one damn thing after another. And they're like, well, even if it's really good, I don't want to be doing that forever. That sounds awful. Here's the good news. We have no idea what time is going to be like in the world to come. Right? Time in this world is part of the physical fabric of reality. We know that space and time are one thing. It's why you get something with high enough gravity, it warps time. All of this world is dissolved. All of this world is remade. God's eternity in himself is absolute, no time at all. We have no idea how to even conceive of that because we can only exist in time. So this is also to say that even though we know some things about the world to come, I said this a few weeks ago too, we can't have any real conception. No one knows, no one can even anticipate what that will be like. All we know and all we are promised is that the world to come will not have an ending. So we can't know exactly how it's going to be, but we can know what it isn't, and it's not going to end. There will never be a time that we are not in existence and that we are not with God. So no more sin, no more death, no more destruction. At the end of the day, we are just with God, and whatever God wants, that's what's going to happen. So whether this is a good news or a bad news for us really just has to do, as all theology does, with whether we dare to trust God. And if we do, then this is a wonderful hope for all Christians. Friends, you guys have made it through Christian Believer. And to all of you who have joined us online, you have made it through Christian Believer. I know this course, you know, it's a nine-month course. It has been a slog. We have birthed a baby of theology in that time. So now all of you are ready to go and lead your own small groups, to lead your own courses. And I hope you do because, as you know, I am not getting immediately replaced uh, here at Wesley Freedom. And the best transition gift that y'all could give me is to um, take this program that I <laughs> have spent a lot of time building up over the last, you know, five years minus COVID and keep it going. Right? So I hope that I have kind of sparked in you a desire to go deeper in theology and deeper in the faith. And I hope that can continue in Wesley Freedom as just the culture of the church, that we worship and we serve and we go deep and we're curious. So with that, I'll let you go.